First of all, thanks so much for joining me today. My name is Dylan Kotecki, and I'm the software and video educator here at On One. And I actually have a fellow coworker with me today. I have Mo with me riding along to answer Q&A questions. So if you have any Q questions, feel free to hit up that Q&A module, and uh, Mo can answer them. And then if it's you know pertinent to whatever I'm showing on the screen, he can stop me, and uh, I'll go ahead and answer those for you guys. Mo, do you want to say something real quick, just so we have the, the audio going? Yeah, like Dylan said, uh, this webinar is being recorded. will be posted up on the blog uh, this afternoon. And if you have any questions, feel free to use that Q&A module throughout. Um, and yeah, just go ahead. Awesome. All right, so today we're going to be talking a lot about real estate. Um, and real estate is basically where I started shooting, actually. I used to work for a property management company in Missoula, Montana. And they used to need photos of houses. So I'd go in and you know I just kind of started shooting just basically one single exposure and trying to edit with it. And then I learned how to shoot HDR. So I've kind of come from both worlds shooting HDR and just modifying the single exposures. And I know there's a bunch of different ways that you can shoot real estate. You can use flashes to um, you know, sort of light up the interiors. You can use HDR or like I did at the beginning, I just started with a single exposure, uh, usually a raw photo. And I would just go in and sort of manipulate the shadows and the exposure to get it you know, to the look I wanted. So I'm going to go over um, how to shoot HDR today, how to merge them together, and then also we're going to do the single exposure. The flash shooting interiors with flash is a little bit, a little bit too high tech for me, and it kind of costs a little bit more. So if you're on the, you know, sort of the basics end of shooting real estate, this should cater more towards you guys. But anyway, so let's get started here. So we're going to start off this webinar. I'm going to show you a few example shots on how to um, sort of get your framing correct and what sort of things I like to shoot for whenever I'm trying to encapsulate a space. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about gear recommendations. Um, you know, what kind of lenses you can use, um, a couple tripods that I'd recommend. And then we're going to go in on how to edit a real estate photo. So I have a few different shots that we can edit. I have a couple drone photos and then just a couple interior shots. So first of all, um, when it comes to shooting an interior, I really like to judge a space by the amount of lines in it. So for example, when you're trying to look for an angle inside of a house, try to try to set your tripod at an area where you can have a, a nice leading line into something interesting. And a good way to do that is try to think about having a wall next to you. So for example, with this shot, I have this nice wall next to me right here, and it has all these lines leading into this other area. So that if I do shoot this shot, not all of the viewer's eyes just, or all of the viewer's attention is going to be on this side of the frame. So you kind of have this leading line that leads people's frame, leads people's eyes into this area as well. So you have this couch here and the TV and this nice little dining room table set so that you have other areas of interest within your shot besides just whatever's right in front of you. And a good thing to note whenever you're shooting interiors is to try not to shoot at the back of furniture. The only reason I shot this shot is because it's a see-through chair and you can see right through it so it's not super distracting and i also kind of felt like it in, it kind of put the person in that chair so they were like oh you know i can i can kind of see myself sitting in this space so those are just a couple things to think about um let's go through another couple of examples here Oops. make sure i'm clicked in so you can see that basically in all of these shots i have you know, some sort of leading line into other parts of the frame. For example, with this couch, this line is leading into this area, and then you have these other lines that are leading over to the window. And basically what I'm doing is I'm trying to show off the space and show off any of the marketable features within that space. So, you know, we have this nice, um, these nice pillars in homes that people really love to have, so the lines leading over to that. But then you also have windows, which Windows in real estate or architecture are, are huge. They're a huge marketable feature. So those are always pretty important to show off or at least get you know, some sort of glance at them within your frame. So um, you have these leading lines leading over to the window and then over to the, the pillar and then also this dining room set. But then you can still see you know, the little ret the ottoman looking thing sitting here. So um, tripod height is also pretty important. So Whenever I'm shooting an interior, whenever I'm raising my tripod height, I like to think about where would I be, where would my eyes be if I was sitting down? So for example, if I was sitting down on this couch, my tripod height 
would match wherever I shot it right here because that's where my eyes would be. And so it allows me to see everything in this interior rather than just being too low to where this couch kind of overcrowds it. Or if you have your tripod too high, it makes like it makes the room seem like it's not as tall and then it makes it seem a lot smaller. So let's go to another shoot I had here. And then for exteriors, so whenever I'm shooting exterior, I like to have my tripod basically all the way up to, um, to where the camera's near my face so that when I'm shooting an exterior, I like to think about whenever you're shooting exterior, to think about when you're standing because you're never really going to be sitting outside and looking at a home. And also it sort of makes the, if you do have a nice sky, you can see a lot more of the sky than if you shot really low. And another thing, if you're shooting really low at a house, it sort of makes the house look really tall and then it makes whatever's leading up to the house make it look like it's on a slope. So just try to think about that whenever you're using your tripod and to think about the tripod height because if you do shoot an interior with the tripod too high, it could make the room seem small. But if you shoot an exterior with the tripod too low, it can make this house seem like it's on a hill. So those are just a couple things to think about whenever you're shooting exteriors or interiors with your tripod. And also the main thing to think about whenever you're shooting real estate on the tripod is to keep your tripod level. So you'll notice that I have these vertical lines that are going up and that's basically just the, the lines on the house. And whenever you're shooting real estate, you really, really want to keep those lines incredibly straight. Um, so if I go back to a, another interior shot, you'll notice how these lines on um, the cabinetry and on the door frames, they're all straight. Because if you do keep your tripod and it tilts back or it moves to the, to the side, let me show you an example of what that would look like. So if I crop it here and say you shoot it and it's a little crooked, that looks so wonky and unrealistic and it just, you know, it doesn't make for a great frame. And same thing if you're shooting exteriors, you really want the, the tripod level at all times. Um, mainly any, you know, architecture or real estate or any sort of buildings, you really want the tripod to be level just so you have those vertical lines straight. Um, it really makes for a nice photo. So we're going to head back to this photo real quick. And uh, so say you edit a photo and you have it merged together and it's all edited. A really quick way that I like to do, because I don't really like to do a whole lot of retouching whenever I'm shooting real estate, because I, I usually like to go in and I'll usually just stage the house to make sure that I don't have to do any major post-processing. But for example, there is some times where I forget that, you know, I miss this leaf right here. And obviously I don't want this, this leaf sitting here. So rather than using, um, the magic eraser or, or sorry, rather than using the clone step tool, I'm just going to grab the magic eraser brush inside of develop. I'm just going to go in and I'm just going to brush that out. And it'll take it away just like that. And a great tool whenever you're shooting exteriors and you do have a nice little area of grass and there's a little bit of dead grass in there. Grab that clone stamp tool, which is over here. It's the clone stamp tool that says fix on it. And you can, oh man, that's a huge brush size. So I'll lower my brush size real quick. And if you hold down option key, that's how you're going to grab your anchor point. And then once you grab your anchor point, grass is pretty easy to, to fix up. So you can just drag down and it'll brush right on there. And so if, if you do have, you know, dead grass patches, the clone stamp tool is probably going to be your best friend for fixing those. And it can take quite a bit of time. You know, if you do have like large areas of dead grass, um, it can take quite a bit of time. But in the end, once you deliver it to the client, they're going to be blown away. Um, if you do, you know, go ahead and do that extra, extra work and get all the dead grass out of the way. Looks like I missed another leaf too. So grab my magic eraser tool here and I'll just lower the brush size. And there we go, I moved it right away. So those are some quick ways that you can retouch a real estate photo, especially exterior. And when you are shooting exterior, look out for the sun, especially if um, it's facing you because you can get lens flares that'll overcome the, that'll come over the roof and you can see them in your lens. But once again, you have these retouch tools. So 
you can just grab your magic, your, or your perfect eraser, and your plus M tool, and you can fix those up super quickly. So now that we've gone over a little bit on you know the angles and the composition and how to frame a shot, there's a few. Sorry, let's go back here. Now I'm going to show you how to merge together an HDR photo inside of On One. So if I grab my HDR shots here, and we'll head down. And I actually just shot these with a drone. So um, we're going to go over a little bit on how to shoot the drone too. Just real quickly, I know not everyone has a drone, but um, just for the future reference if you do get one. So. Let's grab our HDR photos here, and I just shot three exposure brackets. And to merge them in HDR, it's incredibly easy. Just simply grab your photos, and then head over to HDR. And it'll process it incredibly fast. And so now you have your HDR shot pulled up. And with houses, especially, you really want to pull basically all of the details out of not every area in the photo, but realistically, you want everything to be seen. So what I usually like to do is I'll just pull up on the shadows right away. And you'll see that it kind of you know exposes more for those darker areas and you can see a lot more of what's going on in the house. You could also select a um, select this one as your base exposure and it could brighten it up a little bit more. So if you do have you know exposure brackets, say you have three of them and one you know is incredibly bright or you shot it at a um, at a higher exposure, then you can select that one and make that the base exposure, and it would brighten up your overall HDR merge. So now that we have you know our base exposure selected, what I usually like to do, like I said, is just pull up on the shadows. And shooting real estate when you're editing, you don't really want a ton of contrast because you'll notice that if I pull up on this contrast, it makes it too dark, and it sort of brings a lot of those black, dark areas into those shadow tones that I just fixed. So what I like to do is I'll usually just pull down on the contrast, and then I'll go down to my blacks, and then I'll add a little bit of contrast there. But be careful, because you can do it pretty quickly, so well, about like seven, about right there. And also, um, another great thing to think about whenever you're shooting um, exteriors of houses is that the temperature especially if it's a bright day or you're shooting with a bunch of trees or foliage, is your photo is going to turn, about, turn out incredibly green. So this photo is actually not too bad because it was a three um, exposure brackets. But if you do shoot with five, if you're shooting with five or like seven exposure brackets and you merge those together, usually those photos are going to turn out either pretty cool or pretty warm. So just pay attention to that with your temperature slider. I'm actually just going to cool this down a little bit more. About right there. And then I'm just going to pull down on the saturation. And actually, I'm probably going to add a little bit of saturation to this shot. There we go. And so now that we have sort of the basic tone and color for the ex exterior, now let's go into HDR look. And this is where we're going to set the basically the HDR look for the photo. And I generally like to keep it on natural. Um, it seems to be like the most realistic looking um, preset for the HDR look, but um, there's a bunch of different controls in here. And if you do like it a little bit, you know, a little bit more sharp, you can always just go down here and add a little bit more detail, or you can add a little bit more clarity. So I know I know a lot of people like to you know up the clarity and the detail so they can get that nice sharp, um, clear shot with a bunch of detail. And that is that is a great way to do it, especially when when you're shooting real estate, because a lot of people like to see you know, that everything is in focus and everything does have a lot of detail. But I usually like to just stick with natural. It seems to me like the best one. But another great thing about On One Photo Raw, excuse me, is that all of these controls are going to be re-editable at any time. So once you have this look set, you're not set to that look forever. So once we hit save right here, it's going to merge our photos together. And since we have open and develop selected, it's going to open those photos up inside of develop. And there we go. Now we have our HDR shot that we just merged together. And I'm just going to hide that. And you'll see that the, 
the tone and color controls that we edited already are the same as we did, are the, are the same as we did inside HDR, but we can re-edit those. So if I want to turn up the mid-tones, you know, or go back into my HDR look instead of effects, I have those same controls and I can re-edit them at any time. So a quick thing that I like to add onto any sort of HDR shot is I usually like to add a tone enhancer. And I'll go down here into curves. And I don't know, for some reason with real estate, I feel like they all just need like a bump in the mid-tones. So with your curves down here, you're gonna have your shadows on this line, and then you're gonna have your mid-tones and then your highlights. So I usually just grab my mid-tones here and I just boost it up. And then I'll pull down on this. And it adds just like a little bit of depth and a little bit more pop to my shot. So if I turn this on and off, you'll see how I just kind of brought up my midtones and then pulled down on the darker areas to add a little bit of contrast, but also add a little bit of exposure. So now if I hit my backslash key on my keyboard, you know, we really brought that, that HDR photo to life simply by using, you know, a basic tone, tone and color enhancements and then a tone enhancer and just sticking with our HDR look. So let's go back into browse here. And real quick, let's go up to a drone shot. And Mo, are there any questions so far? No, there's no questions coming through. So just a reminder to those who are just joining us recently, there is a Q&A panel module there on your screen. Feel free to use that at any time. I can pass any question up to Dylan if you want him to reshow something or have a question on anything specifically. Uh, otherwise, keep going, Dylan. You're doing great. Thanks, man. All right. So shooting, especially exteriors of photos when you're in the country um, with a drone is pretty important just because, for example, with this photo, you know, I can see that this is the house right here. I don't know why that's all blurry. But anyway, so I can see that the house is right here, and then I have all this land around it. So a lot of people like to see that so that when they're, you know, looking to buy or look at a potential house, you can easily just, you know, look at the size of the land, or what the layout is, what sort of, you know, roads lead to it. So shooting with a drone, especially in the country, is an awesome tool to use, and uh, they're relatively inexpensive. I shoot with a DJI um, Phantom 3 Pro, and I think it ran me on eBay like less than $600. And I'm sure now that there's, you know, millions of drones out there, you could find one for pretty cheap. So um, those are a great tool if you are looking to really get into um, shooting real estate photography. And so if you're shooting a drone shot, I generally do, and I, I like to have at least this as a backup as I shoot HDR exposure brackets. So I shoot three exposure brackets when I'm shooting HDR or when I'm shooting with a drone. But I generally don't use the exposure brackets if I'm, if I'm not shooting the house. So for example, if I'm just shooting the area around the house, I generally just like to grab that shot itself, the single exposure, and then I'll just go into develop. So if you aren't shooting HDR, um, it's, you can still shoot real estate or architecture without shooting HDR or having exposure brackets. And I'll show you that in a minute on how to edit an interior shot without shooting HDR. But just for now, this for the drone shots, I would recommend not shooting HDR unless you're, again, focusing on the house. Because you'll notice that if I, if I shot HDR, or if I don't shoot HDR, it sort of leaves a bunch of contrast in these trees. And I feel like it makes for a lot more interesting of a photo than if every little area had that HDR look and all the shadows were sort of um, exposed for detail because I like a lot of this contrast in these trees and also it leaves the nice um, color of the trees intact rather than if you do shoot auto exposure brackets the colors and the different exposures are going to kind of merge together and so you can kind of get a wash but like I was saying if you do just shoot a single exposure for a drone it's a lot easier to make like a nice realistic look so usually I'll just shoot the drone shot and then I'll just pull up on the exposure and I'll add some contrast and then I'll pull up all my shadows. I mean, incredibly, incredibly basic stuff. I usually don't like to do a ton whenever I'm shooting or whenever I'm editing real estate. I generally just like to get the, the basic editing out of the way. 
So now we'll just add a little bit of black in here and then we'll just crank our structure slider quite a bit. And now if I hit the backslash key on my keyboard, you know, you'll see that we just instantly brought that drone photo to life. And so this is the house I'm shooting right here. And then this is their barn. So this part of the land doesn't even belong to them. So if you are shooting real estate, keep that in mind that you don't include a house that's not theirs. And then you can just simply pull up, use this, this road right here as a frame, and then boom. Now you have, you've, you're showing off all of their property and you're showing off the lay of the land, their house, you know, this, this road right here where they can access that house. And all, you know, you did that in one exposure. So like I was saying earlier, if you are shooting drone and you're shooting, you know, straight down and you're just kind of show, trying to show the lay of the land, I wouldn't recommend shooting the HDR because you can get, you can get those nice contrasty areas in between the trees and it'll look a lot more interesting. So that's how to edit a single exposure for just like the drone portion of shooting real estate. And so let's go back into our shots here. And say you're not shooting auto exposure brackets and you just want to shoot a single exposure shot for, for an interior. And you really just want to mess with the control or the, the adjustments to it to get a nicely exposed foot. You can do that easily. I would recommend that if you are going to do this, to shoot in RAW because it's going to give you a lot more freedom and a lot more power to edit that photo. Um, I think I shot this one in JPEG. Yeah, so this is a JPEG photo, and I think it's a medium JPEG. So if this, doesn't, if this isn't a testament that you can do it with one single shot, then I don't know what is. So basically, what I like to do is if I'm shooting one single photo, is I try to expose for the windows because it's a lot easier to pull up the shadows inside of Photo Raw. So if you're gonna shoot this shot, try to expose for this, these windows over here rather than exposing for this counter. So if you're using autofocus or manual focus, try to expose, try to, try to unfocus your autofocus from this and focus it over here. I know it's gonna look pretty dark in camera, but once again, you can go into Photo Raw's awesome shadow slider and just simply pull up the shadows. And already, you know, basically set the basic tone for our photo in just one single slider. And now what you can do is you can add contrast, you can pull down your blacks, add a bit of mid-tones in here. And if you are shooting single exposure, once you pull up on the shadow slider to bring back some of those darker areas, you're going to be trying to pull up color basically so it's going to it's going to either turn your photo incredibly warm like it is doing now or it's going to cool it down quite a bit so just head down to your temperature slider and just you know whatever way is going to fix the photo so you'll see that with that blue it really helped to minimize that sort of orange look on here even though you know this cabinet's right here were orange um, you know it made it look a lot less super yellow and that the orange colors on these walls. But also, if this isn't doing enough for you, you can easily just go into your local adjustments and you can turn this temperature down. And we'll just actually look at a local adjustment gradient. And you can just drop that down. And the great thing about you know adding any local adjustments is you can just simply head over to your opacity and you can make it seem more realistic by just dragging on the slider. So if I turn this on and off, you know it's really sort of subduing that blue or that sorry that warm color cast over here. And the next thing I like to do is if I'm is it <coughs> sorry if I'm doing one single exposure and I'm editing for it is I'll head into effects and I'll add a filter and I'll just add the HDR look and voila you know from that to that in you know a minute so basically if you are shooting a single exposure try to shoot in raw and expose for the window and then pull up on your shadow slider I mean I wouldn't recommend shooting it so dark that this area is basically black um, I would recommend sort of a like an in-between Maybe have the, the window a little bit blown out, maybe just a tiny bit blown out. 
because you can always pull back on the exposure and then pull up on the shadows. So I would just keep that in mind whenever you're shooting um, a single shot exposure. Are there any questions so far, Mo? No, there, uh, there actually was a question on using Google Earth um, instead of a drone for those images. I don't know if you ever do anything like that um, or want to speak to that at all. But otherwise, there are no questions. Um, yeah. OK. Um, no, I don't really ever, uh, I've never even actually thought about that. But um, if you can do that, that's a great way to bypass having a drone. I'm not sure if you can get that close with that much detail. But then again, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, like I said, if that's what you want to do, then try to do it. So now let's go back in. And I'm going to show you guys real quick on how to edit an already merged exposure. So I just merged this together right before we started this webinar. And you'll see that I have my HDR look applied. And I actually didn't even mess with the exposure or the contrast or anything, because I just wanted to give you guys sort of like the baseline on how I edit. And basically, what I usually like to do is I'll, I'll usually pull down on the exposure to get kind of the windows where I want them. And then, like I was saying earlier, just pull up on the shadows. And it'll bring back a lot of that life within you know, the interiors of your house without blowing out the window. And another great tool, especially when you're shooting real estate, is to you know, play with the structure slider because even though you're adding H an HDR look, it's giving it that HDR look and it's playing with different areas of micro contrast. So if you do want a more um, structured look, you can always just up the structure. And you'll notice that it'll bring back, you know, it'll pull out some of the, the other details in your shot as well. So my photo's looking a little bit warm, especially inside here. I know this area was a little bit more white. So once again, we can head down to our temperature and we'll just pull it back. Probably right about there. And I'm actually going to go up to my midtones real quick, hold them up. And that looks about good for our tone and color. And now let's head into effects. And in our, we have our HDR look applied. And so, like I did with that one photo, I'm just going to head down to tone enhancer. And I'm going to down, go down to curves. And like I usually do, I'll just grab that midtone point and I'll pull it up. Oops. And then I'll just pull down on the darker areas. So if I turn that on and off, you'll see it just kind of livens up the photo a little bit and sort of just brings back a little bit of life to my shot. And after looking at this photo, you can see you know, on this edge of this wall, there's kind of a warping going around. And that's because I'm shooting with a super wide angle lens. And I'll get into a couple different lens types that I would use for um, gear recommendations in a second. But if you do have this going on, say you are shooting with a pretty wide angle lens, you can always head down to develop and go down to your lens correction. And even if it, even if it matches and does it, you can still go into your manual distortion and just pull back on it. And that'll sort of flatten that wall out for you. So now that we have sort of our, you know, we have our wall flattened out, we don't have any warping around the edges. Um, let's go back into develop real quick. And I'm actually going to turn up the temperature just a tad bit more. So there we go. So basically a few things to uh, remember whenever you're editing for an interior is to definitely expose for the window. Try to make the window your priority because if it is blown out, it's gonna look, it's kind of gonna, it's gonna be a little bit distracting for one, and it's also just gonna look kind of weird. Um, if you do have an overcast day, like this was a pretty overcast day, so I could expose pretty evenly for the interior and the exterior. Um, but if you do have a really really hot day and it's really bright and you know this is just blown out, there's so much sun coming in here. Try to shoot a ton of different exposures. So try to shoot you know, five stops down and then shoot five stops up and then just mess with those exposures, you know, grab a couple and merge them together or grab one of the, grab one of the single shot, the single shot exposures and you can go in and readjust those.
So if you do shoot hey, a uh, Dylan, to jump in with a question that I think is relevant, there's actually two questions that are relevant to this topic. Uh, the first one comes from Alan. Do you use anything like the color checker passport to set your white balance when you're shooting? I do not. I so when I when I started shooting real estate, I had like I was in, I was a freshman in college. I didn't have much money, so I kind of just got the basics of what I could get. I didn't have any color checkers or anything like that. I just kind of learned about how to shoot auto exposure brackets. But I've I've read a bunch about those, and they are great for um, definitely getting the color right for interiors because especially when shooting in interiors, those color checkers um, really allow you to modify the in-camera exposure so that when you do come in and you're, you're merging the photos in HDR, uh, they don't come out too warm or too cold, like I was saying. So if you do kind of want to avoid that, definitely I would recommend getting one of those color checkers. But if you can't, you can always just go in and uh, try to mess with the color manually. Awesome. And then also there's a question from Paul here. Do you ever use a polarizer to deal with reflections in the windows? I haven't, but those are a polarizer is an awesome thing to use if you are trying to deal with the reflections in the window. If you did use a polarizer, you wouldn't get any of these these squares in here from the reflections of the frames. Um, yeah, those are another, those are awesome recommendations. Um, the color checker and the polarizer would be great gear recommendations. Um, since we're on that topic, I guess let's just talk a a little bit about a couple gear recommendations. So, um, like the questions we're asking, the color checker is great for making sure you have you know a nice in-camera color exposure for your photo, and then the polarizer is going to help with removing these reflections in the window. It also help with um, when you are exposing for a window because polarizers you can get a, you know, dark sets of polarizers. It'll allow you to shoot for a little bit of a longer exposure and allow for that window to be a little bit less blown out. Um, as far as lenses go, what I use is I use a Canon 12 to 18 millimeter lens. I think anything um, between 12 and 18 is probably going to be your best bet. I'm shooting crop sensor on a Canon 70D, so that's why I use the 12 to 18 millimeter. But if you were shooting, say, on a full frame camera, you'd probably want something 16 and above. Uh, 16 on a full frame would be the same as a 12 millimeter on a crop sensor. So um, a couple good lenses, especially if you're shooting a full frame, would just be like a 16 to 35 or maybe like a 17 to 40. Um, sort of anything in that ballpark um, will be good for uh, getting sort of that wide angle shot for your interiors. And as far as camera bodies go, I would just recommend something that shoots auto exposure brackets because um, you're not really too worried about having incredibly large files, especially if you're shooting HDR. Um, you don't, you're not really too worried about the actual content within that photo. You're just kind of worried about how they merge together. Um, so, yeah, for cameras, I would just recommend, again, something that can shoot auto exposure brackets. Or even if you don't have a camera that can shoot auto exposure brackets, you know, even just shooting that one single exposure, if it does shoot raw, then you do have a lot of play with the different controls. Um, another great tool to use, um, especially when you're shooting real estate, is to have a tripod. I think tripods are probably the most single most important thing to have when you're shooting real estate because it allows you to keep your camera incredibly steady so there's no shake. Because if you do shoot HDR and you're shooting it handheld or you know, you're setting it on a tripod that's not very stable, you can have shake or it can move in between the exposures. And then when you merge them together, you're going to have either some ghosting or you're going to have photos that don't align right. So number one tool when shooting real estate recommended is going to be a tripod. And as far as tripods go, I would definitely recommend using a ball head tripod. Uh, ball head tripods are probably the most, the fastest way to shoot an interior and exterior of a house because you can simply just twist off, or not twist off, but twist the ball head on the tripod, you know, move your camera to where it's at. And then you can take the photo, we'll do a different angle. Um, I'd say ball head tripods are my favorite way to shoot, but you know, there's a bunch of different tripods that you can use. I also shoot with a, there's an, it's an on-camera level, so it's a little level that sits on the hot shoe of my camera where my flash goes. And I think I got it on Amazon for like three bucks or something. And it basically just has two levels. It has a vertical level and then a horizontal level. And I'll just set that on top of my camera and I'll move it around to wherever it's level so that I know that my vertical lines are straight in my photo. Um, and 
It does help too if I'm shooting live view mode. So if I'm shooting from the actual screen and not putting my eye through the viewfinder, I can use that level really quickly, find out its level, and then I could set my ball head tripod tight, and then I could just basically pan to whatever angle I'm shooting for. So those are a few gear recommendations. You know, I'd recommend having like a either a 12 to 18 millimeter or 12 to 20 millimeter if you're shooting like with a crop sensor frame. If you're shooting with a full frame camera, I would recommend like a 17 to 40 or like a 16 to 35 or something in between, you know, 16 to you know, probably 22. So um, are there any questions about that? There's actually another question from Paul here, Dylan, um, that's asking about if you're doing any full room panoramas um, and merging, and what kind of gear recommendations and setups do you have for doing panos indoors? So what I use for shooting panoramas is I shoot with a non, non-circular fisheye. It's an eight millimeter non-circular fisheye lens. And I bought a, um, it's a pano, pano head tripod that's basically it's like a it's hard to explain but it's a pano setup that you set on top of your tripod and um, you can basically move it around and shoot with it I can include I'm gonna actually include the links to all of these recommendations within the description of this video so um, I can sh I can give links to whatever I use for the pano stuff and then the gear recommendations as far as the lenses and the tripods and the cameras and as far as using um, the panorama to stitch my photos together, I basically just shoot them, what would I shoot? So 360 degrees, it would be five different angles in between those the 360 degrees, and then I would just merge those auto exposure brackets of the five angles together. Um, I guess it's kind of hard to explain how to do that um, without demonstrating it, but I'll include a link to that um, description I'll, I'll include a link to all of the things that I'm recommending right now in the description. So sorry if that doesn't answer your question, but I think it'd just be hard to explain over a webinar. Yeah, I think you're good. There's no other questions. Um, to remind people, there's a Q&A module. We're getting close to the end here, so if you have any questions you want answered, now would be the time to ask those in that module. Yeah, thanks so much, Mo. Um, so real quick here, we'll just go back to here and I'll show you guys a couple ways that I've shot in um, the exteriors of buildings so whenever you're shooting especially if you're shooting like a condo or something what I would recommend is to just stand opposite this corner and just aim right at the corner itself and tilt your tripod up, or tilt your camera back and make sure you have this entire thing in frame there's probably going to be you know other buildings here or other buildings here but you can always crop so make sure you have the entire building in the frame. And really important, make sure you have this vertical line as straight as can be, because if it's not, it looks so weird. So once again, definitely keep your verticals as straight as possible and just keep everything in the frame. Shooting exteriors of buildings and architecture is probably the easiest part of shooting real estate because you can kind of just aim your camera up and it'll get a nice shot for you, especially if the building's you know kind of picturesque. Um, you can shoot these photos with single exposures, but the light was coming this way, and if I did shoot this with a single exposure, this area would be super dark and super shadowed out. So I would recommend shooting, if you are shooting exteriors of buildings, I would recommend shooting HDR, because you can always just remove the other auto exposure brackets and play with the single exposure but then you have the option to actually merge those photos together and see how they look. So that's, you know, basically whenever you're shooting exteriors, just rec just keep your camera level, keep your tripod a little bit tilted back, and then just um, make sure your camera's um, levels for the verticals. So I'll show you a couple more exterior shots and then answer a couple more questions and then we'll probably be good for the webinar. So another great thing whenever you're shooting exteriors, is to try to look at the photo um, in terms of composition as well. So like for this shot here, I really wanted these steps to sort of lead, you know, lead into the doorway here, but then I also wanted to, you know, kind of show off the nice little, um, the garden area up front. So I have these little rocks right here, and I also have 
this edge of this building so that people aren't, you know, basically if you shot this photo and you crop this out, so if I crop this photo out here, it doesn't look as interesting because people don't know what's, you know, when's the end of that? You know, when, when does this part end and the other part beginning? So it's always good to give people like a reference to what they're looking at and how large things are, especially if you're shooting houses because that's, you know, a huge thing for people is just wanting to know how big a space is, what that space looks like, you know, what do I see inside that space, what can I fit? So it's always good to give people sort of a reference to where things are at, what they look like, how big they are, and when they end. So let's go to another example here. So for this shot, um, like I was saying earlier with the tripod height, I had this tripod height all the way up and it still kind of made it look like this house was on a hill. I mean, it is on a hill, but it wasn't even that steep. So if you can even, um, if you have like your car parked nearby, I usually like to park my car in front of a house and I'll just set my tripod on top of that. Um, I didn't do that with this shot and I really wish I would have, but it's a good example of showing you guys that if you do have your tripod a little too low, it can kind of make this hill look a little too steep. Um, this photo doesn't look too bad, but just keep in mind that in the future, um, if you do set your tripod a little too low, it can make your house look a little too tall, a little too steep. But So let's go to this one here. And this is another shot basically kind of showing off the front door and then the living room area. And I, the idea of this is I wanted this sort of, this these shrubs right here to, to lead the viewer into this window. And then there's these sort of lines here with the the grass and stuff that leads your eye into the doorway. I probably could have, you know, done something with these leaves right here, up my tripod a little bit, but I think for for just the frame wise to show you guys an example of it, I think it works. So, yeah, the, just re I would recommend um, when you're shooting exteriors or interiors to just really think about, you know, your leading lines into the frame. I'll show you guys another example. So, for example, this photo. Um, we have this bathroom here, and say if I shot it over here with, or I shot this photo without having any of this, it looked dull, you know, it's like, I feel like there needs to be some sort of third wall or um, some sort of reference for the person that's looking at this shot to know where things end or begin. So, like I was saying earlier, just keep in mind to have, you know, some sort of leading lines, leading the viewer into the frame. Um, a great thing to do whenever you're shooting interiors is to just pick up everything, make sure everything looks nice and neat because it'll help with post-processing. You're not going to have a tough time going in and trying to remove things with your magic eraser on top of counters because it's incredibly difficult to remove things inside of a house. You know, it's pretty easy to remove, you know, lens flares or leaves from a yard, but if you had something on the counter here that you didn't want, it's a lot more tough. So. You know, another recommendation is just, just to, you know, make sure whatever you're shooting is, is clean. Um, it's nice and tidy. So, yeah, um, basically that's, uh, that's how to frame a shot and how to get, you know, nice leading lines into your frame. Are there any other questions, Mo? Yeah, there's a couple questions here based on um, recommendations. Um, what drone was it that you recommend or that you were using? So I fly with a Phantom 3 Pro. It's a DJI Phantom 3 Pro. Um, I just like it because I don't really generally shoot a ton of video. Um, and if I do shoot video, it does shoot, uh, what does it shoot? It shoots 4K at 30 frames a second. And it shoots, I think, like 2.7K at 60 frames a second. So if you're just shooting you know, houses or real estate, it does a perfect job for me. It's relatively inexpensive. I think it cost me like less than $600 on eBay. And the photos turn out incredible. So um, that's, yeah, that was, that's what I would recommend. Um, and then also there's a question um, from Alton here. Besides the interior lights in a room, do you supplement the interior shot with external flash? I have before. I haven't um, with many of the shoots recently just because I'm kind of like a, get there and go shoot the HDR real quick. But if you do have a, an interior that's incredibly dark, I definitely would recommend using ex an exterior flash. If you have um, you an off-camera flash sync where you can remote trigger it, even better because you can set the flash where you want it inside of a room. You know, say, you know, you have these shadows right here and the shadows on this tub. 
you could set a flash, you know, maybe even over kind of by this doorway or something, or, you know, hide a flash, set it to like a low setting, and you could flash these areas to remove some of the shadows, and then it would look a lot more like everything's exposed. If you do have like a well-lit house, and especially this, um, this skylight was helping out, but if you do have a dark house, yeah, I would definitely recommend using a, an exterior flash. Awesome. And then here's a great question from Paul again. Um, what are your best practices for finding customers and selling your services? I think definitely creating a website, one. Um, I think websites are huge because people can, you know, traffic them, find you, and see your work. I think if you have a good body of work, it kind of speaks for itself. Um, when I moved to Portland and was kind of trying to do this full time, I basically would, I created a website, I made a gallery, and then I went on to Google AdWords, and I made a couple ads. Um, Craigslist is an awesome way to, you know, find clients. You know, you can make a post on Craigslist and, you know, say, hey, I'm shooting real estate or put some, some of your images on there. People also search for real estate photographers on there. Um, there's a couple sites out there. There's Upwork and Thumbtack, and I've gotten a few different clients on Thumbtack, you know, just looking for real estate shots. I think the biggest thing is to just keep searching. Um, there's always people looking for your work. So I would just, you know, look on Thumbtack, look on Upwork, use Craigslist, use Google AdWords. And also you could just cold email. That's what I did. I, you know, if you just Google real estate, you know, realtors in whatever town you are, just shoot them an email and say, hey, I, you know, are you looking for real estate photos? Include a link to your gallery or include a couple photos and just say, you know, here's your price or, um, you know, give them a deal. Because once you reach out to that person and they say, you know, hey, you know, this guy's pretty, pretty low in price, then you already have a client. So try to beat people with prices. Um, just self-marketing is huge and just continue looking for your, for clients on different platforms. I think that's the best way to do it. Does that so yeah, there's no other no other questions. That was a great answer. Um, so yeah, keep on going if you got more. Awesome. Well, I think that kind of concludes our webinar. Um, thank you so much for um, joining me today. I hope that helped a little bit about um, photographing real estate. I'm going to actually do another one of these in two weeks, three weeks, um, whenever my next webinar is. And so we'll go a little bit more in depth on how to do it and uh, maybe a few more gear recommendations that I can show on screen. And so yeah, thanks so much for joining me today, guys. I really appreciate it. And once again, this webinar is being recorded and we'll post that on the blog and YouTube um, later today. And I'll include links in the description to whatever gear I recommended. So thanks again, guys. I appreciate it and have a great day.